Well, I think that's uh, I'm on record. Okay, okay, we should just start right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I we think have. so. Right. So please, Marcelo, go to the so, introduction. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, as uh, we as we stated when we started the seminar, we can't let any virus uh, set our seminar consumption to zero. So it's a great uh, chance we have today to have Alex joining us from uh, Nova Lisboa and uh, sharing with us his exciting research on uh, intersection between climate change and economics. He has a very exciting paper, so I won't uh, steal any further time from him. Alex is assistant professor of econ at uh, NOVA, and uh, I just let the, the, the floor to him. And the, the rules are have been already have been already sent by email. And uh, any any comment Alex said that he'd, he'd be welcome throughout the presentation. Alex, you have uh, about an hour. It's all yours. Okay, thanks, thanks Marcello for, uh, for the introduction and uh, thanks everybody for this, the opportunity to present, the, uh, present this work. Uh, as Marcello said, um, this work is about the relationship between the ocean and uh, childhood mortality. And we will be using uh, climate change as a source of variation to understand how this, uh, this uh, relationship is, um, is working. Okay, so this is a joint work uh, with uh, Ivan Quintaveras, which is at uh, Universidad de Navarra. And uh, comments are very welcome because we are trying to uh, finalize the, uh, the work. Okay, so... Um, I think it's skipping one slide. <laughs> Yes, let me just open it with another, um, because otherwise it's keeping one, one slide. Sorry for the technical issue. No, doesn't look it's working, so. Yeah, it's keeping one slide, so I'll keep, uh, I'll keep the two, the two slides, otherwise you're not gonna be able to see it. I hope it's okay with the two slides. Um, okay, so um, the relationship between the ocean and uh, human and human behavior is still very little uh, understood. At the same time, we know that uh, fish is a very important source for uh, for food uh, initially. So we know that more than three billion people are relying on um, on marine and coastal biodiversity for their survival. And uh, we also know that uh, the behavior of human in the last, let's say, 30, 40 years has generated a sustained decrease in, uh, in fish stocks. Okay? So we can think uh, of, uh, of this as being related to, for example, industrial fishing, uh, to the generation of pollution in coastal areas, and to um, the development of, uh, of cities, of urbanization along coastal areas. Okay? So the, the main fact here is that we know that fish stocks has decreased um, substantially in the last years. So at the same time, people are facing a new or relatively new phenomenon, which is the impact of climate change on, uh, on the ocean. And the impact, this impact is mainly deriving by a series of, uh, of factors, but, but is mainly deriving through a change in chemistry in the ocean. Okay, so the absorption of um, CO2 by the ocean has generated a change in the water chemistry by making water more uh, acidic. Okay, so we we know that from the industrial revolution to uh, nowadays, uh, acidity in the ocean has increased by twenty six percent, and is expected to keep on increasing uh, 
in, uh, in the future. Okay, the effect of uh, acidic waters is still not, um, um, so we are still trying to understand what is the effect of acidic waters on a series of factors, which is, for example, uh, fish behavior or redistribution of fish along the world. Uh, but one thing it's uh, almost certain, that acidic waters is making the metabolic cost of um, marine life to be, um, to be more, more costlier, and at the same time is destroying coral reefs. And we know that coral reefs are very important for uh, human uh, um, survival, I would say, because that's where most of the artisanal uh, and subsistence fishing is happening. So there's a lot of communities which are relying on, uh, uh, on these areas and on the uh, diversity, biodiversity of these areas for their survival. Now, we also know that the consequences of these two phenomena, okay, so the reduction in uh, fish stocks and uh, climate change has the worst consequences for developing countries. Okay, so and the, the reason of this is that uh, developing countries are heavily reliant on uh, fish for nutrition, and at the same time, they've been experiencing larger declines in, uh, in fish stocks. Okay, so why fish is uh, so important for uh, nutrition in developing countries, so in a setting in which you don't have alternatives, fish is providing very important nutrients. And this is particularly important during uh, maternity, okay, so in the, the gestation period, because it's providing nutrients which allows the, um, which allow fetal growth to continue in a sustained way. So for example, uh, proteins are very important for fetal growth, uh, but at the same time, other micronutrients, such as iron, which allows the creation of, uh, of blood dur during fetal growth, or other uh, micronutrients, such as uh, iodine, omega-3, calcium, and zinc, are very important for the uh, brain and cognitive development of, uh, of children. Okay, so given the situation, we are interested in understanding what is the effect of, uh, for example, what is the effect of reduction in uh, a natural resource, which is in this case fish, on, um, on early childhood mortality. Okay? And that's the, that is going to be the main question we want to raise. But at the same time, we know that first, uh, fish is not observable. Okay, so we don't know... Uh, I mean, we kind of know in a, in, a, in a more global way, but not in a very detailed way. We don't know uh, where fish stocks are exactly uh, located and how they change if they're not uh, fished. And we also know that fishing is highly endogenous to uh, human development. Okay? So that means that measuring a relationship between uh, fish, fish stocks and, um, and early child mortality is very difficult to be identified. Okay, so what we uh, do in this paper, we try to answer this question by looking at climate change. Okay, so we, explo we uh, exploit variation, exogenous variation, which is determined by uh, climate change to, cha to try to study the effect of uh, change in ocean chemistry on um, the mortality of children living in communities which relies on, uh, on the ocean. Okay, so to do so, to give you a preview of uh, what we do in the paper, we look at uh, more than 1.5 million births, uh, which are happening from the 72 to 2018 across 36 developing countries. Okay, so we look at, a very, um, at this question from a global perspective. Uh, then each birth is matched to variation, uh, which is time and spatial variation in ocean acidity while in uh, utero, okay, so during the gestation period. And finally, we uh, identify this causal relationship by using uh, high dimensional uh, fixed effect. And uh, what are the main findings? So to give you a preview, we find a significant increase in uh, neonatal deaths um, when acidity is increased. So it's important to note that um, neonatal, neonatal deaths are very closely associated in the med medical literature with malnutrition in, uh, during pregnancy. Okay? And, and that's why we will be focusing most of our attention on this, uh, on this type of mortality rate. Uh, we see evidence of death harvesting. Okay? So by, I will explain a little bit more in detail what we mean by death harvesting. Uh, what we mean in generally is that we observe a selection 
among the uh, children which are dying. And this selection, as we will see, is mainly um, determined by weakness. Okay? So basically, the weaker children are dying more often if, in, if, if they're experiencing higher acidity in utero. And finally, we find evidence of uh, a nutrition channel, okay? which is what we, uh, we see as determining, as determining this effect. One, just can I ask one qualification question? Sure. sure. If, you can, if you hear me. Um, so, if I got it correctly, um, in a regression of uh, human development on uh, fish supply, fish supply is endogenous, and climate change shocks the, the fish supply. Uh, in a, an IV setting, I, I, some, I guess, or fixed effect or panel IV setting. Am I on um, the right track or? No, so um, we're not going to be an IV, we use an IV because uh, fish is just unobservable. So we will measure the direct effect of climate change, okay. measured by uh, acidification, and we will try to prove that this is related to uh, nutrition, which is linking clearly the two, um, the two mechanisms together. Uh, but as I said, this is not an IV setting. It will be a direct measure of uh, the effect of ocean acidification on uh, mortality. And the reason is purely because we cannot observe uh, um, fish presence, basically. Or if we can observe it, it we cannot observe it at the level of, of uh, granularity that we are using in the paper for the identification strategy. Just have one question, Alex. I understand that you have the uh, local levels of uh, acidification, no? In the okay, mm -hmm. so it's not the same acidification in the uh, Chilean shore in the Pacific than in the Atlantic, and depending on the Niño and this kind of phenomena, and this will uh, generate uh, variance across areas. No? That's the your point. Yeah. So as I will explain in a bit in uh, greater detail, so we are matching. Uh, so we're using geolocated data of uh, location of birth and we match this with local variation in acidity uh, which is also measured at monthly level so i will explain a little bit more in detail what's how we measure how we measure that but uh, you will have something uh, for climate change do you consider it a global uh, problem or does it so um in this case climate change uh, I will explain a little bit more in detail, but okay. just to give you a, an insight, climate change is making, uh, so as we know, climate change is a, global, uh, um, is a global phenomenon in this case. Globally, the same way the global temperature is going up, but it's not uniform across, across the globe, uh, acidification is working pretty much in the same way. So on average, the oceans are becoming more acidic but there are some areas which are becoming more acidic faster and some areas which are becoming more acidic, acidic slower. And at the same time, uh, acidification is creating a, a difference in seasonal variation. So acidity in the water is changing across the year, depending on longitude and latitude. And what is climate change doing is uh, shifting the way um, acidification is changing within the year. So in other words, seasonal variation. So we will exploit okay. these two sources of variation to uh, in our identification strategy. But I, okay. I will I will get in more more in detail. Yeah. One more comment for which I don't need an answer now. You can take it uh, throughout the presentation. Is uh, you talk about fish supply, which is unobservable. Now I got it. What uh, what was in the back of my mind is the following: uh, you don't don't only you do not observe fish supply, but you don't observe fish demand either. So where, if I was referring to the paper, uh, I would need to be clear is uh, how climate change and uh, fish supply demand and say their equilibrium price interact. Is okay. Because I can see a scenario in which fish supply goes down or one in which, in which fish supply is more or less unchanged, but the quality of fish changes so some fishing is not worth commercially as a consequence the price goes up 
of the fish which you can change and, and fish becomes a more di diversified good. Yeah, so I learned... Uh, to, to all the, the mechanisms you, you, yeah. you need to... Yeah, this is, this is an important comment. I will give you uh, a very quick answer. Um, so first of you, all... You can take it later if you wish. I don't want to slow you down because time, you, you don't have um, two hours. So nah, I'll, 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 be, I'll be fast on this. So first of all, we know prices are going up. So the, the fish prices are going up globally. I, I'm not going to show it, but mm -hmm. uh, you can see the fish prices are going up. Now, if you think at uh, fish demand, um, we can look at um, fish dependency, which is what FAO is generally using as a measure of uh, fish demand. Okay, okay. And um, for just as an example of uh, the way it's computed, this is aggregate information which is looking at the, for example, fish proteins as percentage of total animal proteins consumed. And as you can see, and this is a kind of, uh, it was also surprising to me, but it's a well-known finding in, um, in, this part, in this type of, of the literature, is that fish demand is constant. Uh, there is very little variation in the way countries change their consumptions of fish. And you can see that this data is from the 60s to nowadays, you can clearly see that uh, if there is something that is not changing, you can see some small variation, but on average, countries tend to stay pretty much in the same level. So people tend to consume um, a very similar amount of fish uh, across a very large amount of time. So the main finding here is that both fish patterns, which is the finding in the scientific literature, and fish consumption are two things that are very little volatile. So they tend to be very constant across uh, across time okay so just a, a small uh, clar clarification here so let me move into the contribution um, so first of all this paper we want to provide a global estimate first of this type of relationship it's something that is not present in the in the literature uh, second point of contribution is we want to uh, show or clarify the relationship between ocean for human development, there is very little uh, evidence. So most of the evidence rely on uh, the relationship between natural productivity and long-term development. So we know that if your country has better waters, you tend to be more developed in the long run. Um, but it's more of an association rather than a causal uh, relationship. And most of the evidence relies on ecological or, um, or macro model. Okay, there is actually no evidence on micro evidence on the relationship between oceans and uh, childhood mortality, for example. A third point is the impact uh, of climate change, which in this case is slightly different because it's not directly observable. Okay, so most of the literature focuses on the impact of temperature and precipitations, which are very important uh, inputs, for example, in agriculture. And these are very directly uh, observed or felt uh, shocks. Well, if you think about acidification, uh, you can look at the ocean and you might not perceive that water uh, change its acidity. If not, the life inside of it might have changed, but you don't see that uh, effect. So we provide evidence of how people react to these type of shocks and we provide new evidence on, uh, on, uh, on this channel of the effect of climate change. And finally, we provide new evidence on the mechanism behind neonatal mortality. There is a relatively large evidence in the medical literature, uh, which is pretty much very local based on the relationship between, uh, uh, for example, nutrition, maternal nutrition and neonatal mortality. Uh, but there is very little evidence on, global, uh, um, on the global effect of certain variables on neonatal mortality. And the reason is that Neonatal mortality remains a relatively rare phenomenon. Okay, so you need, basically need a lot of observations and a lot of variation to observe uh, any, to identify any effect along these dimensions. Um, okay, so main sources of information we will use is basically three. Okay, we will be using a source of information to uh, measure child mortality and child health. Uh, as I will explain in detail, we use uh, DHS, so Demographic and Health Surveys uh, program, to build birth histories. 
And uh, these data sets also allow us to build child level and mother level information about health investments, for example. And we will merge this information uh, together with information about ocean acidification. And I will uh, explain a little bit more in detail, but uh, we will basically be measuring variation in uh, pH at surface. Okay, so pH is measuring acidity. Uh, when pH decreases, water becomes more acidic. Uh, when pH increases, it becoming more uh, basic. And we will be using the um, Adley Global Environment Model 2, which provides this type of information. And I will uh, explain more in detail in a few slides. And then we also use additional sources of information, uh, which allow us to control for other confounders, which can be, for example, uh, temperature and precipitation at the location of birth. OK, so thinking about child mortality. Uh, child mortality, um, it's something that has been kind of forgotten in developed countries, but it's something that has been still, uh, still an issue and a wide issue in developing countries. So if you look at 1980, you can see that most of the mortality, uh, neonatal mortality, is based in developing countries. And if you move along to 2000, 2018, you see that most of the world has kind of solved the issue of uh, neonatal mortality uh, with very low numbers, below zero, uh, in the range of zero to four uh, per 1,000 deaths. But you can see that, especially in Africa and Southeast Asia, uh, neonatal deaths uh, remain, uh, remain an issue. And so for this reason, it is important to try to understand what are the uh, causes and the mechanisms driving these, uh, these, uh, these phenomena. Okay, so let me get into the data about child mortality. Okay, so child mortality will be our main uh, outcome variable. So what we did is to build a very large data set by merging together all available DHS data sets, which contains geocoded information. Okay, so this is uh, 96 household surveys collected from 1990s to 2018, uh, which brings together national representative data on 36 develop developing countries. Okay, so for these countries, we are uh, rebuilding, because that's what the DHS is doing. Uh, we are rebuilding birth histories for each mother. So for each mother, we know all the live births that happen over time and whether the, whether the birth has been survived or whether the child died in between the birth and the interview. And at the same time, we can also observe information about uh, maternal and child health. Okay, so in this, uh, in this figure uh, on the left, you can see the whole data set that we built. So each dot represents a DHS cluster. Uh, DHS cluster is, a, is very simply a primary sampling unit, is a, a village or a neighborhood. And uh, in each village, there is a number of mothers has been, uh, uh, has been interviewed. Okay, so each dot represents pretty much uh, a village or, uh, or a neighborhood. Then what we did is to, uh, to do a first type of selection, which is selecting only countries with access to the ocean. Okay, so clearly, we don't want in this paper to focus on uh, general equilibrium effects of the ocean on the whole world, but we really want to care uh, about the effect of this variation in a very local uh, in a very local way. So first step is selecting countries that have uh, access to ocean. So as you can see, uh, most of the countries in the data set do have access to ocean, even if some countries have uh, very small areas. Some other countries, especially Southeast Asia, uh, can have very large uh, access to, uh, to ocean with full coastlines. So for example, full countries, which are, uh, which are islands. Now, the second question we, uh, the second point we want to understand is how do we select uh, the sample? Okay, so this is a kind of a not easy uh, question to address because we will know that our estimate would be function of distance from the ocean. And at the same time, there is no clear way to define what is uh, an area affected by, um, by the ocean. Okay, so what we did is to use uh, all our information in the sense that we have geocoded information for each community. And this allows us to build uh, distances. And more specifically, we build for each community, we build a straight line distance uh, to the closest point uh, to the ocean, to the coastline. 
Uh, this allows us to apply uh, standard definition, which are generally used more in, uh, uh, let's say, in qualitative research. Uh, but this allows us to identify coastal area. So by coastal area, we uh, apply first the definition of the United Nations, which is the coastal area is an area extending from the ocean 100 kilometers inwards, and we define these as coastal area. Then we use our own definition, um, which if I will have enough time, I will explain how we decide this, how we choose this bound. Uh, but we define vulnerable coastal area as the area being slightly closer to the ocean and specifically being uh, extending landward up to 40 kilometers. Then in the paper, we also use alternative definition, uh, but our results are robust to this, uh, to this definition. Okay, so to give you an idea uh, of what we do in practice, after we computed distance, uh, on the left we see what is the remaining, uh, what is the sample, highlighted in red. And in the right, you can see uh, an example of uh, the resulting variation we exploit. And so uh, the dots will be sampled areas in the coastal area. The red dots are um, communities which are in a vulnerable coastal area, so very close to the ocean, and the others are the remaining ones in the coastal area, which are not exactly in uh, high proximity uh, to the ocean. Okay, so once we build uh, information about the uh, mortality rates and we know what are our communities of interest, what is our population of interest, what we do is to build information about um, about ocean acidity. Okay, so we use uh, what is known as the ADJAM2 uh, Earth System model. Okay, so this is provided by the European Space, Space Agency. Uh, it is important to note this is. Sorry, uh, if, if I may interrupt, so may I ask you a clarifying question? Sure. So could you say something? Because you are focusing a lot in Africa, but the country that worries me the most is, is India, because uh, it's very different. Uh, the south of India from the north of India. It's. I, I was wondering if you can say something about that. In particular, I mean the south. It's 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 mostly vegetarian. There is an area that it's uh, uh, the area of Kerala that that basically consume fish, while the north is more meat eater. So I was wondering if that. Uh, no? Yeah. You could say something about this. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a that's a kind of uh, uh, so. This is going back to the general question of who is depending on fish and who is consuming fish. Uh, we were searching for that information uh, and it's generally very difficult to find out geocoded or like very granular information on areas where people eat more fish or eat less fish. So most of these information are aggregated. So the way we solve this question, the only way we, we can solve this question is to focus on distance. So it is true that some areas of India, for example, do not uh, they do not eat uh, they do not eat fish, so they're purely vegetarian. Uh, but that's something we cannot um, we cannot check. So or at least we cannot observe directly, uh, or at least that's something we do not try to look at because it's more difficult. And something we could we could do is to try to look at heterogeneity later on in terms of uh, of states. Um, that, but that's a good point. That's something we have not uh, we have not done. So what we assume? I, I was wondering that maybe consumption surveys, that United Nations consumption, uh, consumption surveys, may give you a hint on you know what's. Uh, yeah. So what? I'm what not we, a specialist on that area, but uh, but that's, what we are, what we are doing is to do it in aggregate terms. So we look at heterogeneity in aggregate terms. Um, but for for India, for example, you will know the average of, uh, of whole India. And we see that the effects, as I will explain later, are larger for countries which are more dependent on fish, that eat more fish, basically. Uh, but going into the detail of, uh, you know, identifying a village with, where people are not uh, fish eaters, it's very, uh, it's very difficult. So the only way we can do that is to assume that if you live on the coast or very close to the coast, like in this case, um, your probability of depending on fish or in eating fish is uh, very large. Uh, there is evidence, not global evidence, this is true, uh, 
Uh, but you know, again, India is, is going to be a very special case, and we have not looked at. You know, maybe there is some information coming from uh, consumption data, uh, but we have not we have not looked at that um, up to now. But that's that's definitely that's definitely a good point. Yeah, as a safety measure, one easy check could be to divide India in northern India and southern India that are very different and treat them as two different countries. Uh, because it's, it's a very big country, unlike. Uh, so it's something similar to what they've done with uh, China, talking about rural and urban yeah. China, as treating them as two different countries. Yeah, so keep, keep in mind that for India, while, as you can see here, India has a lot of data points, uh, what we use for India is purely um these points so only 100 kilometers on the coast uh, but it's true that, uh, that, that that's a good point we have not we have not looked at that and we should uh, look at it especially because india has a very large uh, number of observations which allow us to also look within uh, uh, within india that's that's a good point okay so um data about so time variation in terms of, uh, of mortality is now matched with, um, with information about ocean acidity. So we used, um, we used this data set, which I have to be uh, honest, uh, in this case is, um, is, a, is a reprocessed data set, which is kind of common in, uh, in climatology, in the sense that this is a data set which combine information from satellite imaging uh, with, with models and machine learning in order to predict the future, uh, but also predict the past. And the reason is that the use of satellites is very recent, and especially there is no evidence still, it's an ongoing research field in climatology to try to measure uh, water acidity from the satellites, so there is still no uh, clear product which allow us to measure that. So we base our uh, variation on uh, models that have been used to predict the future, um, especially these are the models used by the IPCC to, to predict uh, future uh, scenarios for, uh, for climate change. But this also allow us to go back in time. Okay? So to use information uh, which have been uh, recorded, okay? fewer, fewer information, generally temperature and rainfall, uh, to build also variation in, uh, in the ocean. And we apply this because this allow us to have a granular variation. Okay? So we can observe at one by one degree resolution in the ocean. So uh, just to make clear, at the equator, this is pretty much 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers uh, squares. And it allows us to go back in time. And specifically going back up to the very first uh, verse that we observe in the data set, which is back in the 70s. Now, because we have uh, this type of variation, we can match um, birth, um, birth histories with the um, acidity in the ocean during the gestation period. Okay, so we will exploit this type of, uh, of variation. So now you cannot see very clearly because you have both slides in front of you, but um, comparing the two figures, you can see that there is a, a variation. These are two figures for the same specific areas I was uh, underlined before, from 72 to 2018, okay? And, uh, and this is the type of variation we exploit in terms of, uh, of acidity. Now, I'll go very quickly on descriptives, uh, just to give, you, um, to give you an idea. So on the left, you have um, descriptives for acidity, which is matched to our uh, sample. Okay, so this is not average in the ocean. This is, uh, this is acidity assigned to each community, which is the closest point to the ocean. So what we can see uh, in uh, panel A, on average, there is a downward trend. Okay, so that's exactly what I was saying before. On average, the ocean is becoming more acidic. Uh, it would be the same if we plot temperature there, but going in the opposite. Uh, direction. And the second important uh, feature is that the ocean acidity is changing naturally across the year. Okay? So some seasons acidity is higher, and some other seasons acidity is, uh, tends to be lower. Okay, so what climate change is doing is making this within-year variation to change differently across the globe. 
And I will explain a little bit in more detail how we exploit this. Now, the script is, I will skip it, uh, so there's no need to go through the script of the uh, sample. So in terms of identification, so how do we uh, identify the effect of varying ocean acidity on neonatal mortality? So we exploit generally two type of uh, variation. First, the DHS and the use of birth histories allows observing for each mother uh, many children. So in other words, for a very specific location, we can match child level variation during in utero, uh, but being born in exactly in the same in the same location. Okay, so this is isolating two things. First, we can also compare children born in the same place but exposed to different um, levels of uh, acidity. But at the same time, this isolate the effect to the mother only because this isolating the effect purely to the gestation period because we just focus on the exposure during uh, in utero. Then matching this information with um, variation of uh, ocean pH allows exploiting two types of uh, exogenous variation. The first one is that acidification is not happening at the same rate. Uh, so while overall as, um, pH is going down uh, on average, this is not going down in the same way across the globe. So in other words, we are, some regions are, ex are um, experiencing faster acidification and some other re regions are experiencing slower acidification. More importantly, this variation is not determined locally. Uh, this variation is determined globally and is mainly determined by all these, var these variables. So for example, winds, which have been used uh, widely uh, in the literature as a source of exogenous variation, uh, temperature, sea ice, precipitations, uh, ocean circulation, and absorption, absorption of CO2. Okay, so most of these variables, uh, actually all of these variables, do not have a direct relationship with local human development. The second thing that we want to uh, uh, exploit is the fact that we, we don't observe year of birth, what we, we do observe month and year of birth. Okay, so the fact that we can observe month uh, of birth we can also exploit variation within a specific year. Okay, so children born in a specific month will experience, will have experienced different uh, level of acidity as compared to children born in a different uh, month. Okay, so we call this differential seasonality. And we know that climate change is making this variation within, um, within uh, the year to be sharper or less sharp depending on uh, different areas. Again, being exogenous to local variation. Okay, so on the right, we have our final uh, specification. So as a dependent variable, as I said, we will be using uh, child level information in terms of mortality. Uh, our main source of variation will be pH, which is the uh, ocean acidity. Then we will use a series of controls, uh, time-varying controls, which can be birth and mother characteristics, uh, temperature and precipitation at the year of birth, and some other characteristic of the ocean. Okay, so for example, the uh, characteristic of uh, oxygen con concentration. Okay, so this is picking up the fact that the ocean is not only becoming more acidic, it's also becoming warmer, and we want to try to isolate purely the effect of uh, acidity by adding this, uh, this very specific control. Then um, adding a large amount of data allow us to introduce a large set of fixed effects. Um, okay, so first of all, we can introduce cluster fixed effect. Okay, so these allow us to compare children born exactly in the same location, but varying, with varying uh, levels of uh, in utero pH. And it also allow us to control him for any characteristic of that community, which is time invariant. Okay, so for example, geography, uh, the fact that you have a better uh, water condition to start with, and so on. Then we can, uh, because we have a large amount of, uh, of data, we also have multiple kids born in exactly the same month and year across different states. 
which allow us to control for very specific time fixed effects. So the fact that in a very specific month of a very specific year, uh, something happened, uh, and this is globally, of course, and, and this is captured by this, uh, by this fixed effect. Finally, uh, because we just want to uh, identify variation which are uh, coming from climate change, which are not already picked up by the global trend and by local seasonality, we introduce uh, controls for local trends and local seasonality. Okay, so local trends will be an interaction between uh, year of birth and uh, location. Uh, which in this case we use location at, uh, at different levels. It can be the country, a district, or a smaller, a smaller uh, area. And we use controls and local seasonality uh, by using interaction between location, again, same as a control district or grid cells, and month of birth. Okay, so these two uh, series of controls capture a way um, variation which is coming from local trends and local seasonality and the remaining variation is just what is deviating from these local trends and local seasonality controls. Now in the more mass conservative specification we extend the specification by introducing mother fixed effect. Okay so in developing countries fertility tends to be uh, large which means that the vast majority of mothers at the time of the interview, at at least two births, or more than one, which means that we can introduce a uh, mother fixed effect. Okay, so mother fixed effect, uh, remove from the sample mothers that have had only one birth at the time of the interview, but uh, allows controlling for mother-specific time invariant characteristics. So in other words, what we are doing, we are just comparing siblings born, uh, of course, from the same mother, but a different point in time and having experienced different uh, levels of, uh, of pH while in, uh, in utero. Okay, so let me move to uh, the results. So as I said, we... Sorry, sorry just, just a clarifying question. So when you talk about, when you say that mothers who have more than one child, uh, so are you removing those whose sibling or whose, child, whose children died before? Or? No, so um, we will, uh, we always include live births. So each observation is a live birth. The DHS do not, uh, do not have information for uh, everything that happens before a birth. So they don't record uh, still births, for example. Uh, the only information we observe is if the child is uh, born. So each observation is that one. Now introducing Mother fixed effect automatically removes uh, mothers that have only one observation, which is the mothers which have only one light birth. But we don't do any selection in terms of, uh, of uh, mortality in this case. Okay, so in our very first, in our very first uh, regression, our dependent variable is the uh, neonatal mortality rate, which is basically a dummy variable, which is one, if uh, the child died within the first month of life and uh, multiplied by 1,000 1, to be consistent with the, with the literature and zero otherwise. Here, the only selection we do is to select at the time of the interview uh, children that have born at least one month before the interview. Uh, this is just to avoid uh, running regression of kids uh, which are which might be 15 days old and they might die in between 15 and 30 days uh, and so our regression will uh, will not pick up uh, pick up those cases okay so this is the tables the way we the way we present it so column three column one to three is focusing on the coastal area so a, just to remind you uh, zero to 100 kilometers from the ocean and column four to six is focusing on uh, the area from zero to 40 kilometers. Okay, so uh, what we call by vulner vulnerable coastal area. Uh, panel A is the benchmark specification. Panel B is the specification with mother fixed effect. Uh, each column is introducing different types of uh, local seasonality, uh, going from uh, larger 
seasonality uh, control, which is the country level seasonality, uh, going towards smaller effects, which is uh, cell level seasonality. And these cells are uh, five degrees by five degrees. Okay, so these are relatively small, uh, small areas. Okay, so what do we observe? Um, first of all, if we look at the benchmark specification, there is a clear negative uh, effect of acidification. So remember, here it, it can be complicated because acidification is a reduction in pH. So the interpretation of the effects are going in the other way around. So an increase in pH is, tends to be positive. So uh, um, we see that acidification is increasing mortality. Uh, the estimates are significant across all specification. They tend to be larger if you live uh, in vulnerable coastal areas compared to coastal areas. Now, if we move to mother fixed effects, uh, we see that this effect is uh, also very consistent, slightly larger, it's not statistically different from the other estimates, uh, but we also see that this is significant. Uh, so from this table, we generalize that there is a clear effect, causal effect of experiencing uh, higher acidity during in utero on the probability of surviving the first month of, uh, of life. Now, um, we also implement different type of uh, selection criteria. Some selection criteria are also based on altitude, for example. Uh, this is an example. We can select only areas which are smaller uh, which are at altitudes lower than 100 meters. Um, you see a comparison in the left, what's, there's actually not much variation because generally areas by the coast tends to be at lower uh, altitudes. But what we can see on the, on the right is that if we implement selection criteria uh, which are more specific and also based um, on additional uh, altitude criteria, we see that this effect is uh, still uh, significant, is actually becoming, in some cases, larger and more, uh, more precise. Okay, so in, in other words, you can select these areas in uh, all possible ways, uh, but these effects tends to be pretty much robust to selection, uh, to selection criteria. Okay, so the next question we want to answer, so we know that the medical literature is linking neonatal deaths with maternal malnutrition. So we want to understand a little bit more of what is happening later on. So we uh, identify two general mechanisms. One is a uh, persistent mechanism, is the fact that um, a shock in utero persists over time and can actually become larger or a death, death harvesting mechanism. So death harvesting is pretty much what we are seeing uh, today uh, with the COVID uh, crisis, in which um, a shock is anticipating death of certain categories of, uh, of people. So in this case, the death harvesting effect is you, ex you, ex you experience a shock, then some people will die, but they would have probably died earlier than the others. So what is the shock is doing is anticipating the, the date of birth, of death, and in some way is the disappearing over time. Okay, so what we do is to uh, first show that the um, effect is very specific to in utero exposure. So if we put in a regression pH a different type of, of, uh, of uh, life as compared to the birth, we can have 10 months before birth in utero, the month of birth or after birth. And we can see that the effect on uh, neonatal mortality is very specific to the period uh, in utero. Okay, so there's not, no statistically significant effect of what is happening before or after uh, birth, which is the first indication that the effect is very specific to in utero exposure. And then what we do is to estimate um, what is happening afterwards. Okay, so what is the probability of dying once you experience a shock in utero for every single month uh, after, your, after the birth of the child? Okay, so both of these graphs are presenting each, row, each uh, point is an estimate. So it's a probability of, of uh, dying by the date. 
and to just to make uh, things clear, the very first point on the left is exactly the estimate we did because it's the probability of dying in the first month of life. And then we generalize this regression uh, to every single month up to age five. Uh, on the left, we have coastal area, okay? So this larger, larger area. On the right, we have vulnerable uh, coastal area, so smaller area. But what we see is clear. This is a clear indication of death harvesting uh, effect. So children experience a shock in utero. They die when they experience that shock very early in life, and that shock disappears over time. Uh, it is disappearing very fast in coastal area, where we have more, uh, um, say, we also have individuals further away from the ocean. And it's disappearing slower, but it's also disappearing in the vulnerable uh, coastal area. Okay, so this is indication of a mechanism which is purely going through the um, through a death harvesting mechanisms. Now, I think time is, uh, I have to speed up, so um, I will go very quickly on this. If we look at survivors, uh, we clearly see that survivors are better off in areas that experience the shock, uh, which is a clear uh, evidence. And, and this is, for example, by looking at anthropometrics or by mortality. So in other words, in areas that you experience, where you experience the shock, people tend to be, uh, to have higher weight and also have lower morbidity. Uh, so this is an indication that the children, which would have had lower weight and higher morbi morbidity in those areas, they die earlier. And the reason is that we, we cannot measure anthropometrics or morbidity of children that died very early in life. So this is an indication that the mechanism is working through an anticipation of death, but is also anticipating a death of very specific kids, which are the kids which are uh, weaker to start with. Now we take uh, we take this uh, result. Okay, so death harvesting effect, an effect on neonatal mortality, and we try to explain why we, uh, why we see this effect. Uh, we highlight two general uh, mechanisms which can, explain, which can explain this. So one is an household income uh, effect. Okay, so it's an effect in which, uh, you know, a lot of community members rely on fishing. There is less fish, uh, less income, you invest less on uh, health and you turn up being uh, weaker because you don't invest in health. Or we can have a maternal uh, nutrition mechanism. Okay? Maternal nutrition is there's no fish, uh, you don't consume fish, you don't have those nutrients, uh, you don't have substitutes for those nutrients and you end up uh, being marginally more uh, worse nutrition during in utero and you, you lack those nutrients which are very important for uh, fetal growth. Um, now, I'm not gonna have time to show this, but in terms of eating fish, what we did is to look at uh, the probability of having eaten fish at the time of the interview, which is a question which is asked for certain, uh, uh, in certain surveys, and linking this with pH at the time of the interview. And we clearly see that when pH is, um, when acidity is lower, people's reports having, eat, having eaten less fish, which is kind of uh, in line with both mechanisms, but it's a clear indication that when pH is worse, people eat. Uh, uh, there is not also less fish, but people eat uh, less fish. Okay, so let me try to convince you that uh, it's not mechanisms one, but it's mechanisms, uh, mechanisms two. So what we did is to look at the very directly health investment. So the DHS has information on child level investments in terms of antenatal and uh, delivery care. So we look at whether during pregnancy, the mother attended any visit, the number of visits, whether they attended visits with health professionals, which is a doctor or a nurse, and during delivery, whether they, uh, they gave delivery in an health center and whether they gave delivery in presence of a health professional. Okay, so these are the five types of investments we look at. So if it's a real story of less fish, less income, then we should observe variation in this type of, uh, in this type of outcomes. 
Um, at the same time, we clearly see that pH in utero is totally uh, unrelated to this type of variation. Okay, so we don't see any effect of experiencing pH in utero on probability of the mother attending more visits, attending better visits, delivering in an health center, or delivering with, uh, with a health profession. It is true in coastal areas, uh, it is true also in vulnerable uh, coastal areas. So there is basically no evidence of change in, um, in health uh, investment. Now, if uh, this is true, the next question we want to ask is, is fishing the very important, uh, so is the presence of fish the most important uh, reason behind these, uh, these mechanisms? Okay, so we know that communities relying for fish in qualitative evidence, they live on the coast, uh, generally. They live on the coast or they live along estuaries. So what we can do is, again, exploit variation in terms of distance and estimate the marginal effect of pH on uh, neonatal mortality as a function of distance. And this is what we get. The effect of NMR is very specific of people living exactly on the shore. If you go further away from the coast, uh, the effect becomes zero. Uh, now, here you see also darker colors because it's an indication of a, a number of observations. Uh, it's also because a lot of people live on the coast. Um, so the certainty of our estimates are much larger along the coast than away from the coast. Uh, but it's a clear indication that um, if you live exactly on the, on the shore, uh, the effect of pH is uh, larger and uh, more significant as compared if you live further away. Now, as a placebo, what we do is also to try to measure the effect of proximity to water, uh, water bodies. Okay, so we did exactly the same. Instead of computing distance from uh, ocean, we compute distance from rivers and lakes and estimate exactly the same marginal effect. What we see that the marginal effect is exactly flat. Okay, so if you live very close to the ocean, you get very large effect of neonatal deaths, of uh, pH on neonatal deaths, but independently of um, living closer next to the ocean, if you live close or further away from a river or a lake or other water bodies, the effect of NMR is pretty much, uh, is pretty much constant. There's actually no effect of rivers on, uh, on this. So this is already an indication that uh, our effect has to be driven by, uh, by fishing or availability of fish. So in order to test this further, what we did is to try to think directly about fish. Now, um, presence of fishing, the presence of fish is not observable. So what we want to measure in this case is to try to build a measure of uh, fish impression under the assumption that more fishing is reducing stocks of fish uh, further. Okay, so we build this information using two uh, sources. One is uh, presence of industrial fishing. Uh, this is a data set uh, which has been built using uh, automatic identification system. This is the same system that uh, airplanes use to avoid collisions. And it works very simply. So it sends a signal by saying where the, uh, feed, the boat is, and it's containing some information, including what is the fish, the, the vessel doing, whether it's, it's fishing. Okay, so we draw from uh, uh, the data set produced by Crossman and others, and we can come up with a measure uh, for an, ag an aggregate period, 2012 16, of where industrial fishing is more. Um, is as a higher pressure. And at the same time, we also want to measure local fishing. Okay, so local fishing is uh, focusing on different type of boats. So we're looking at boats that are using a, a light to catch fishes, to attract fish. And we use this algorithm, uh, which is basically using night lights to identify where boats are. And, and this data set and this algorithm provides um, geolocation of boats, a certain specific day on a sp specific night. And we build a same resolution data set for uh, when the data is available. Okay, so 17 and 19 
Just to give you an idea of variation, that's what uh, we got for South Southeast Asia. So on the left is intensity of commercial fishing, and on the right is intensity of uh, local fishing. Okay, so these are two slightly different measures. You can see that uh, boats are operating in very different areas. But if you look, for example, um, Mozambique or the, the eastern coast of Africa, you can clearly see that local fishing is very limited, but commercial fishing and industrial fishing is very intense. Okay, so we use these two measures, we match these two measures, and uh, we define uh, areas with high pressure are areas that have high intensity of both local and industrial fishing. Now, and we estimate separately the effect of NMR, the effect of pH on NMR on these two uh, dimensions. So we clearly see that the effect is driven by areas where commercial fishing, well, well the uh, fishing pressure is uh, higher. Okay, so where um, fishing pressure is higher, we do observe statistically significant larger effects of pH on, uh, on mortality. Uh, not only if we don't have time to show it, but this effect is mainly driven by uh, industrial fishing, which is uh, um, industrial fishing has a much lower effect on uh, local communities, but rather as, uh, as, as kind of fishing and take away the catch. Now, um, similarly, we also see that this heterogeneity is very specific to the coast. Uh, okay, so we see that this, uh, as we've seen before, on the right graph, this heterogeneity is very specific for communities which live, we live living very, very close to, uh, to the coastline. Okay, so I don't know how much time I have left. I think I'm kind of uh, uh, closing. Um, so just to, cl to, to, to give you a final point, summing up the uh, initial comment of, uh, of Marcello, so we also did something related to fish prices. Uh, fish prices are not available at the disaggregated level that we have, apart from one country. Uh, one country in which fish is very important, which is the Philippines. Okay, so for the Philippines, uh, we built we collected information from the 90s to nowadays for uh, uh, fish prices. So on the right, you see what is the time series of each province level uh, fish price and the median. So you can see it's, it's growing up. And you also see that there is uh, geographical uh, variation. And what we did is to do exactly the same we did up to now, but instead of looking at pH, we look at average fish prices in, uh, in utero. Uh, so what we see, it's, uh, it's kind of totally in line of what we've seen up to now. So higher prices, higher fish prices in utero, which is indicating at the same time uh, less availability of fish, but also more difficulty to buy fish if you want, if you have a fixed uh, income. So higher fish prices are increasing neonatal deaths, which is in kind of uh, in line with the conclusion that we are um, we are we are trying to 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 push now if we go in column seven eight we only have one country here so we only have the philippines so if we go very very local uh, with controls then this effect is kind of being captured by uh, but controls but if we stay larger uh, we clearly see a significant effect even if we control for mother fixed effects, which is a very, very, very conservative, um, very conservative uh, set of controls. Okay, so because time is uh, running out, so I will just conclude. Okay, so in this paper, we provide the very first evidence of the link uh, between uh, exploitation of natural resources, which in this case is the sea, on the uh, selection of birth. So we see that variation in uh, ocean acidity, which is closely linked with availability of, uh, of fish, is, um, is determining neonatal mortalities, and this effect is disappearing over time. And we show that this is mainly driven by uh, nutrition channel. And uh, um, I will skip discussion of 
uh, research avenues. Okay, so if you, I probably went a little bit out of time. If you have any questions, if you have time, I can answer now, or otherwise I'm happy to uh, discuss any time. Okay, so I think that we have at least five minutes for questions, so please, anybody? Okay. One quick question is about uh, the low, the substitutability and or complementarity, or complementarity actually, between say local and industrial fishing, the results you showed on local industrial fishing. Uh, to what extent uh, the places which suffer more by, are more dependent on industrial fishing are less dependent on, uh, on local. Uh, I'm not sure how you need to do this by fixing this. So in some... If you control for proportions, the supply, you, you, you have to fix the supply, you're allowed to change it. It's... Uh... But say, is it a side or a proportion effect? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to square someone. Yeah. Some, yeah. Some so the... the, the... In, in some sense, the um, complementarity is kind of, we are kind of using it because we distinguish between areas where, where they have very high intensity of um, of both local fishing and and, um, and local fishing. So we got this heterogeneous effect when we really focus on these very high intensity uh, intensity areas. So if we focus, if we can, we can also split the two effects and estimate for areas which have high and low local fishing and high and low, um, high and low um, commercial industrial fishing. So we see that the heterogeneity is mainly driven by the industrial fishing, but it's not enough to identify statistically significant uh, areas. So the largest statistically significant effect is really coming from areas where there is large industrial and people do rely a lot on local fishing. Uh, so in some sense, oh, this is picking up a little bit of the, um, of the complementarity. Now, there is very little evidence in economics on this, but there's actually a lot of evidence in uh, qualitative evidence or in, in other literature, which is the phenomenon of uh, industrial fishing in developing countries. Um, so there is a growing evidence of the fact that the higher price of fish prices has been substituted in, um, in developed countries by fishing in developing countries. Okay? So the, this is clear evidence of the fact that industrial fishing is pretty much fishing for developed countries. Uh, there is no clear evidence uh, but I think that our paper is also pushing on that story where we, we cannot really, really show it. Um, so the idea of thinking about local fishing is really thinking about areas where uh, people really rely a lot on, on, on local fishing, both for economic activity and for uh, non-economic activity, uh, or just for consumption. Um, so for those areas, we see that if you are in high or low, the effect is always negative and significant. It's slightly larger when you are in high local fishing, but it's not statistically different. Uh, so the real difference is really driven by industrial fishing. So can, can this be related somewhat? Uh, can, can, is there a positive correlation between industrial fishing and, uh, say, uh, and trade of, uh, say, of food trade. I'm, I'm thinking of a, of a potential pitch as a downside of uh, trade is uh, that if you don't account, if you don't control for the source, for the, for the, for the, if you don't, con yeah, that if you don't, yeah, that, that may be hurting poor local communities. Um, just, just thinking loud. You, you may not enough, uh, you may not have enough, uh, uh, Power to test something something similar if it, if it makes sense at all. No, the only way we can do. Um, let's see if I find it. So trade is included in those measures of fish dependency. 
which I was showing. I don't have it here. Right. So these measures of each dependency are including trade. Um, but data about trades, uh, again, they are like country level. Uh, that's something we, we have not done, but that's something we, we can do. Uh, I'm pretty sure that industrial is, is related to trades. Um, I know that correlation between industrial and local is very low. So they, let's say that uh, different vessels, they go very different areas. But we have not looked at very specific trade components, so that's something we have not we have not looked looked at. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. We should probably look at that, uh, especially because trade data should be available. I have a very noisy question. I think that since I, this is a, it's a feeling I have that the industrial uh, uh, fishing is very concentrated, the consumption in a very few countries, namely Japan, Spain, um, I don't know. Okay. Could you, uh, and the kind of species that are fish for the commercial are quite specific, uh, tuna, Surface and the like, and all the things that you can fish al along Chile. Okay, I think I uh, could you find any correlation with well, I, that's the problem no? that you have micro data, mm -hmm. and could you find any uh, relation with the with the fish eating countries with the problems with acidification, global problems of acidification in the ocean? Because I guess that. Well, there are many ships from many countries that do industrial fishing, but everything goes to Japan, maybe from, maybe from Spain to Spain. Yeah, that's, that's, kind, of, that, that's kind of our point, right? So, um, so first of all, industrial fishing, and this, this, so we cannot distinguish here. So the only really available data is to know if we can know that in a very specific uh, in a very specific day, there was a boat. Uh, well, if it's industrial, it's going to be a large boat uh, fishing uh, somewhere. But we cannot observe where these, um, where the product they collect is going to end up. That's for sure what you're saying. So there is large evidence that uh, there is a lot of fishing uh, across on the coast of, of, of uh, developing countries which is feeding uh, the market in developed countries. So this is something that uh, is, um, is widely available in terms of qualitative evidence. So there's not much of uh, direct evidence that industrial fishing is, is, is determining that. The second point is that uh, industrial fishing, there is evidence that uh, industrial fishing also use practices that are not super uh, correct. So um, they might be fishing of tuna, but might be capturing any other type of uh, fish and not for consumption. And so they are using the use of uh, uh, industrial fishing practices is uh, associated in the qualitative literature with, uh, with as one of the main responsible of together with pollution uh, to the reduction in, uh, in fish catch, uh, in fish supply uh, globally. Uh, that being said, um, we don't we, we cannot we do not know whether um, you know, there is some industrial fishing across the coast of the Philippines, and that's uh, that is feeding um, the Philippines or it's going somewhere else. Uh, we do have just we can only rely on qualitative evidence to know that there is large evidence of uh, industrial fishing happening across along the coast of developing countries, but ending up in markets. In, uh, in developed countries, uh, which is of course in line with the story of more industrial fishing, uh, reducing consumption of fish in, um, in, the, um, in developing countries. We still have time for one question to be well. Okay, so well, Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. And I think that uh, as every time 
it's time for you to open, for the audience to open the mix and give a great applause to, to Alex. So, thank you very much. Thanks to you. Now, thanks to you for the comments and for the opportunity to present. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Carmelo, bien.